Good afternoon. Hello. My name is Marielle Villaray. I'm Program Development Director for the Office of Academic Initiatives and Strategic Innovation here at the Graduate Center and the Director for LP Squared, a lifelong peer learning program formerly known as the IRP. Welcome to Fridays at 3, a series of public talks organized by members of LP Squared on a range of topics, including history, politics, and the media, science and medicine, and that's representative of just this fall semester. I'd like to thank the Fridays at 3 committee for their work to organize a great series while we all adjust to virtual events. Before we get started today, I want to encourage you to submit your questions for the Q&A that will follow Dr. Blazer's talk. Please use the Q&A tool available at the bottom of your Zoom window to type in your questions at any point throughout the program and we'll pick those up for discussion. Now I'll turn it over to Leslie Herman to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Martin Blazer. Leslie, unmute. Sorry. Thank you, Marielle. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Martin J. Blazer. Dr. Blazer holds the Henry Rutgers Chair of the Human Microbiome at Rutgers University and serves as the director of the Center for Advanced Biotechnology and Medicine. Previously, he served as chair of the Department of Medicine at New York University. In 2014, Dr. Blazer published his groundbreaking book, Missing Microbes, How the Use of Antibiotics is Fueling Our Modern Plagues. The following year, Time Magazine listed him as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. His book has been translated into 20 languages and his findings on the importance of the microbiome are universally accepted today. In his talk today, Dr. Blazer will bring us up to date on the newest developments in his research on the microbiome. And since he is also working with the CDC now on the pandemic, you're welcome to ask him questions about this as well. I should mention, by the way, that Dr. Blazer just happens to be the cousin and friend of longtime LP Squared member, Ruth Clapper, which makes him doubly dear to us. I give you Dr. Blazer. Uh, Leslie, thank you so much for your, uh, for your introduction. Uh, and thank you for mentioning my dear cousin, Ruth, uh, to whom I am most fond and owe a lot. And I'm very happy to participate in this event through CUNY. I'm a native New Yorker and CUNY has meant a lot to my family. In fact, my father graduated from Brooklyn College. So part of the CUNY system. So let me try to begin. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen and I'll ask you, Leslie, if you can see my screen. Can yes, we see it just fine. Okay, great. So, um, so thanks for the introduction, very kind introduction. Today, I'm gonna to talk about the health consequences of perturbing the early life micro, microbiota. And I'm gonna explain as I go along. And this, this, uh, this talk is going to have uh, several parts. First, we're going to start with the prologue. I'd like to tell you about the human microbiome, what I, what I mean by that. So here, here's an artist's view of ancient peoples and their ancient microbes. And we published this a number of years ago to, in, in a way to illustrate the point that humans have been colonized by microbes since before they were humans. We can say that the, these microbes collectively are the human microbiome. These organisms are ancient, they are persistent. That means that when you acquire one, you basically have it for life in general. Many of them are conserved, which means that there are certain microbes that everyone listening shares in common. And then there are others that are host specific that only some people 
in this audience have and others do not. Now here's what I might call a microbiologist view of the human body. Human cells in the human body about 10 to the 13th, about, about 10 trillion, actually 30 trillion. Microbial cells about 10 to the 14th, about 100 trillion. And it's color coded because most of the cells in the human body are microbial. It leads us to the interesting question, who are we? Here's another microbiologist view of the human body. Uh, our microbiome is, exists in different compartments, in our nostril, on our skin, in our hair, in our stomach, in our, especially in our intestine. And these, these pie charts represent the distribution of particular taxa of microbes. These are the species and groups of microbes. And you can see all these pie charts are different. The microbes in one part of the body are different from the microbes in another part of the body. And, and my skin is closer to your skin than let's say my skin is to my colon. So that, that is part of the conservation of microbes that we know. Now here's another graph, uh, which is, we might call this a geneticist view of the human body. This is the proportion of unique genes in the human body. The human genome is about 23,000 genes, but each of us is carrying on average about 2 million different microbial genes. About 99% of the unique genes in your body are microbial, not, uh, not human. So we might ask, what are they all doing? And that's what I hope to talk about today. So to, as one last introduction to this subject, I'd like to show you these two views of the ice sheet in Greenland. Here's uh, on the left is 1992, and on the right is 2002. And what you can see is that there's a lot less ice in 2002. And this is one representation of climate change, of global warming. And we could define this as a change in our macroecology due to, due to the effects of, of human activities. And what I'm gonna talk about is a change in our microecology, which I contend is just as important as this. So there are gonna be four acts. Here's act one, description of the problem. So all of us know that there have been certain diseases that have increased dramatically in recent decades. For example, asthma all over the world has gone up dramatically. Or juvenile diabetes, which is doubling every 20 or 25 years all around the world. Or diseases of the esophagus, like reflux esophagitis and a particular cancer that it leads to has gone through the roof. Why are all these diseases happening at the same time? And if there are 10 diseases happening at the same time, do they have 10 separate causes? Or is it possible that one cause is underlying them all? So I wanna talk about one of these epidemic diseases to start with, and that's obesity. So this slide shows three maps from the CDC looking at obesity trends in US adults, uh, which we can consider a kind of changing human physiology. In 1989, there was no state in the United States where more than 10% of adults, uh, where more than 14% of adults were obese. By 2010, there is no state in the United States with less than 20% obesity. And in fact, the national average now exceeds 30%. So what's remarkable here is that it is happening everywhere. And the distance between the first map and the last map is only 21 years. Something very powerful is going on. Now we know that obesity in adults begins in childhood. And here are data from the NHANES, the National, Survey, National Random Surveys of the US population over about a 35 year period looking at obesity and overweight 
in children at the youngest age, two to five years, up to 19 years. And you can see the trend over time. All of these groups, there are more and more kids who are overweight and obese. And we know that obesity in children leads to obesity in adolescents, leads to obesity in adults. Now, those are data from the United States. What about the rest of the world? So here's recent data from WHO looking at comparison of time trends of overweight and obese children globally. The red line is the trends in uh, kids in developed countries like the United States. And uh, looking at the kids under five who were, who were already overweight and obese, uh, by, by just about now, it's about 14% of, of kids. And in developing countries, not surprisingly, the rates are lower. But if you look at where the developing countries are today, it's kind of where we were about 30 years ago. And there's lots of evidence that what happened in the developed countries is happening in developing countries as well, but that there is this long time lag. Now, these are the trends of overweight. What about the actual numbers? So this is, these are from the same source. The green line is all the overweight kids in the world. And now it's, we can look at what's the proportion of those kids in developed countries and in developing countries. In fact, most of the overweight kids in the world are in developing countries, in part because that's where most of the children in the world live. So overweight and obesity is becoming epidemic, not just in developed countries, but in developing countries, it has in fact been a pandemic. So how can we explain this? Where, where could this be coming from? So I wanna to try to link this to the microbiome and you'll see there are a lot of linkages. So how does the microbiome develop in a, in a person? I showed you those pie charts and told you that there are similarities so we did a study a few years ago in healthy children in New York from the, for, from the time they were birth, born uh, up to the age of two years old. And we were looking for the predominant organisms in their intestinal tract. And this was run by Nick Bokulich when he was a postdoctoral fellow in my lab. In this graph, the timeline are months of life and the y-axis is the abundance of particular taxa in the intestine. And the names aren't important, it's the colors that are important. And what we see is that when children are born, their intestinal tract is dominated by these purple bacteria, and then they're taken over by these light blue bacteria, which are called uh, bacteroides, and then bifidobacteria, and fecalibacteria, and clostridium. This is a very regular phenomenon. If you look at children anywhere in the world, you will see a graph somewhat like this. So this is, this is not accidental. The organisms that we acquire are quite consistent. They're very choreographed. Now, another question that comes up is when does a baby change from their baby microbiome to their uh, adult microbiome? And this, uh, was has been answered in different forms, but I'd like to show you the study by Tanya Yatsenenko and colleagues, uh, where they asked, when does the adult gut microbiome become established? This was a study of children in the US, in Amerindians in South America, in Malawians in, uh, in Africa. This was done in Jeff Gordon's lab with Rob Knight and Maria Gloria Dominguez as principal investigators. So the x-axis is age in childhood, each circle represents the composite of the gut microbiome in one individual. And the y-axis is something called unifrac distance between children and adults. This is an indication of dissimilarity. And so what the data show very clearly is that when kids are born, the population structure of their microbiome is very unadult-like. But gradually and progressively, it becomes more and more adult-like until it is. And what's remarkable here is that the transition point is the age of three. The first three years of life 
or when the microbiome is forming, when it's gaining its adult form. It is also the period of life when babies are forming. They're forming their immunity, their metabolism, and their cognition. So I want to talk about how babies acquire their microbiome. And it turns out that moms are really important. This slide represents the intergenerational transfer of microbes from mothers to child, which has been going on since time immemorial. So babies, we were all babies at one time, and we were born in a womb because we are mammals. Uh, and our first exposure to the world of microbes happens when the water breaks and we descend through the birth canal and we are covered by the mom's microbes. And then there is skin to skin contact with the baby and the mother. The baby's mouth full of microbes inoculates the breast and now breast milk and microbes go in to form the foundation of the microbiota of the GI tract. Moms are kissing babies, they're licking babies, they're pre-masticating food. Lots of redundant pathways for transferring microbes from one generation to the next. This is how all mammals have done it for the last 150 million years. But in fact, in modern days, something is different. Modern moms live in a world of antiseptics. They have received antibiotics, including many courses, including when they're pregnant. They have, they have antibacterials in their diet. So the moms today are different. And the babies today also are different. Babies may not have the passage through the birth canal. They may be born by cesarean section. And today in the United States, about 32% of babies, one baby in three are born by C-section. They have missed this initial passage through the birth canal. In some countries, the proportion of kids born by C-section exceeds 50%. That means that C-sections have become the new normal. Babies are also bathed extensively. They receive formula, which only superficially resembles human milk. And babies are getting a lot of medications, including antibiotics, which I'll talk about in some detail. So considering this changed circumstance, over the last 20 years, I've developed an idea, which I call the theory of the disappearing microbiota. And this theory basically has two tenets. The first is that changed human ecology has altered transmission and maintenance of ancestral microbes, which affects the composition of the microbiota. And the second is that the microbes, both good and bad, that are usually acquired early in life are especially important since they affect a developmentally critical stage. Now, about 10 years ago, working with Stan Falco at Stanford, we enlarged this hypothesis and it is shown here the effect of maternal status on the resident microbiota of the next generation. Our idea is that ancient moms would transmit an ancient microbiota to their, to their infants. And, but if they happen to lose microbes, then the next generation would be born at a deficit unless they could get it back horizontally from other people. But if they couldn't, then each generation might be born at a deficit. And in this way, we are actually stepping down on the diversity of our microbiota, that the changes are cumulative across time. And if that's true, that represents a very big change in human ecology. Unfortunately, there's more and more evidence that this is true. And I'll just show you one example we're here, we're looking at the prevalence of Helicobacter pylori in Japanese families. Helicobacter pylori was the dominant organism in the human stomach, but has been disappearing. And you can see it in this study of families. Here's grandmothers, mothers, children, the same kind of step that we have postulated. And in other data sets, we have found the same thing as well. So the human microbiome seems to be disappearing. 
So what could be responsible for that? And there are many factors. I mentioned C-section as one, and I'm gonna come back to that. But I wanna focus on one really important factor, which is antibiotics. All of us know that antibiotics have been one of the greatest discoveries of humankind, certainly one of the greatest discoveries of the 20th century. Here's Alexander Fleming reenacting the discovery of penicillin. Antibiotics came into medical practice in the late 1940s. Antibiotics have saved innumerable lives. They have revolutionized every aspect of medicine. And as a result, doctors and other practitioners have been using antibiotics more and more and more. How much more? Well, a recent WHO survey indicated on average about 73 billion doses of antibiotics around the world every, every year. So that represents about 10 antibiotic pills for every man, woman, and child on earth every year, and the numbers are going up. In the US, the CDC has actually counted the number of courses. In 2011, there were 262 million courses of antibiotics used. That's 842 courses per thousand people, or five courses for every six people year after year. In children, based on the CDC data, we can estimate that by the time they're two, they have received nearly three courses of antibiotics on average. And by the time they're 10, they've received about 10 courses of antibiotics on average. During pregnancy in the United States, more than 50% of pregnant women are treated with antibiotics or given antibiotics for prophylaxis just before the intergenerational transfer of microbes. And because there's widespread use of antibiotics on farms, there is also exposure to humans from this, although we, do, we don't really have any idea of what the scale is. Now, what about developing countries? We think in developing countries, they don't have much access to medicines, but they have a lot of access to antibiotics. This slide looks at antibiotic use in the first two years of life among children in, in eight different uh, uh, cities in the developing world. This is a study funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Each line is antibiotic use in one of these places. The x-axis is age during the first two years of life. The y-axis is antibiotic courses per person year. And to this graph, I added a line. This is the rate of antibiotic use in the first two years of life in the US. And what you can see is that in six of these eight places, antibiotic use is greater than in the US. And in, and in, in, in this, uh, in Bangladesh and in Pakistan, in the first year of life, the average number of courses of antibiotics that the children were receiving exceeds 10. Now you would say, how is this possible? How could they get so many courses of antibiotics? But in fact, these children have parents who love them. And when the children are ill, uh, with, uh, with uh, respiratory symptoms or gastrointestinal symptoms or a fever. They take their children to a pharmacist who is happy to sell them a course of antibiotics. So in fact, the developing world started later in their use of antibiotics, but they seem to be catching up in a hurry. So we can think about the ecological effects of antibiotic exposure like the proverbial iceberg. The tip of the iceberg is something that has been long recognized, which is antibiotic resistance, which we've known about since the 1940s and has been increasing dramatically. But what's the body of the iceberg? And I, I'm speculating that the body of, of the iceberg is disruption of the microbiome leading to clinical consequences. These consequences can be transient or they can be long-term. They can be developmental, situational, senescent, or generational. And they could involve metabolism, infections, cancers, and maternal transfer. And in the rest of the talk, I'm gonna be giving you examples of each of these phenomena. So in total, 
I believe that we are, uh, and I wrote a commentary in the journal Cell, the past and future microbiology of the human microbiome in an age of extinctions. I believe we are in an age of extinction of the microbiome and it has consequences. Act two. Now I'll show you a recent study in children that focuses on the importance of early life antibiotic exposures. This is a study that I conducted with colleagues at the Mayo Clinic, and it was just published two weeks ago. Association of Infant Antibiotic Exposure with Childhood Health Outcomes. We wanted to know if kids received antibiotics, would that affect their health in the years to follow? So this study was done in Olmsted County in Rochester, Minnesota, where the Mayo Clinic is located. And it was to assess associations with antibiotic exposure over about a 13 year period. We, we examined all the children born in Olmsted County from January, 2003 to 2016. And we assessed the period of antibiotic exposure up to the age of two. And then we asked what were their health outcomes from the age of two to 13. In total, 18,000 children were born in Olmsted County during this time. We excluded about 3,500 children for different uh, reasons. And we analyzed uh, about uh, 14,000 children. So here are some of the characteristics of the study children relative to antibiotic exposure in the first two years, two years of life. Of those 14,000 children, about 10,000 were exposed, received antibiotics in the first two years of life, and about 4,000 did not. In total, there are about 7,000 girls and about 7,000 boys. And in those that received antibiotics, we can see that uh, uh, more than 4,000 received one or two courses of antibiotics in the first year, two years of life. Uh, about 2,000 received three or four courses. Uh, 3,000 received five or more courses. And the antibiotic classes uh, were very commonly used antibiotics, penicillins, cephalosporins, and macrolides especially, and a, a lesser number received uh, sulfa drugs. So what were the results? Well, this slide uh, looks at a, a typical technique called the Kaplan-Meier analysis, where we're looking to the time to the event, and the curves that I'm going to show you are stratified by sex and by antibiotic exposure. So let's start with asthma. So this is an outcome in childhood. We're looking at the rate of the probability of asthma in children up to the age of 14. The, the red lines are, are females and the blue lines are males. So this re solid red line are, are females without antibiotic exposure in the first two years of life. The dotted red line is with antibiotic exposure. Here's, here's males without antibiotic exposure and with antibiotic exposure. You see the big differences. Here's hay fever, girls without and with antibiotics, boys without and with antibiotics. Overweight, boys and girls overlap with anti without antibiotics, but it's greater with antibiotics. Here's ADHD, attention deficit disorder. Girls without antibiotics, and with, boys without, and with. This is one way to look at the data. Here's another way to look at the data. Associations between the antibiotic exposures in the first two years of life and risk of 10 common health conditions with childhood onset. And these conditions include asthma, hay fever, food allergy, uh, atopic dermatitis or eczema, celiac disease, overweight, obesity, ADHD, autism, learning dis disability. In this graph here, we, we look at the adjusted hazard ratio. A hazard ratio of one is neutral. That means that kids who were exposed to antibiotics were no more likely than kids who were unexposed to have a disease. And numbers over one indicate that kids exposed to antibiotics have greater risk of the disease. Well, you can see that almost all, and, and the, uh, the um, circle is, is the mean, and these are the confidence intervals around it. So for eight of the 10 condition, the, the numbers are all above one, 
and they are statistically significant. In two, in two others, they're above one, uh, but they're not statistically significant. So in eight of these 10 conditions, antibiotic use in the first two years of life was associated with increased hazard of kids developing these different conditions. So as I said, this was published about two weeks ago in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Um, I'll just summarize some of the main findings because I don't have time to show you everything. We found that there was an association of later development disease with antibiotic exposure. We found that the number of courses mattered. More courses were associated with more out, bad outcomes. We found that the timing of the exposure was important in most cases, that exposure in the first six months of life was worse than exposure later in the first two years. And specific antibiotic classes were particularly associated with the risk for eight important childhood diseases. So this is, this is all correlation. This, this shows that antibiotic exposure is associated with later risk of disease, but do antibiotics actually cause the later disease? And, and we, can't, we can't answer that from those experiment, from, from those observations, but we can in other ways. So in act three, I'm gonna address the question, do early life exposures to antibiotics increase susceptibility to disease? And I'm also gonna throw in C-sections in one study. So first, I want to talk about some of the metabolic consequences that, that we are postulating as a result of antibiotics and microbiome disruption. So I told you that uh, the CDC has been tracking antibiotic use uh, for quite some time. And this is, this is a map of antibiotic, outpatient antibiotic usage rate rates by region of the country in, in 2010. The national average then was 833 courses per thousand population. Here in the Northeast, the rate was 830, very similar to the national average. Midwest, 868, quite similar as well. But in the West, 638, much less. And in the South, 936. It's about a 50% difference between the South and the West. In some states, in the South have double the amount of antibiotic use per capita compared to the West. And this is across tens of millions of people year after year. This cannot be explained by differences in rates of serious bacterial infections. This reflects differences in the practice of medicine and the culture of medicine. And this, this particular graph has been stable for many, many years. Now, being interested in geography, I wanna show you these two maps. These are both from the CDC, comparing in the year 2010, comparing the geography of obesity and the geography of antibiotic use. And if you look at these two maps side by side, you will see that there's a lot of resemblance between them. Now, these are observational data. They show that there is some association of antibiotic use in obesity, but they don't tell us anything about causality, whether A causes B, B causes A, or perhaps C causes both A and B, but they get our attention and they are consistent with the idea that antibiotics have something to do with obesity. In fact, we know much more about that because of observations that farmers have made over the last 75 years. So about 75 years ago, agricultural scientists found that if farmers put antibiotics into the food and water of their livestock, it would promote their growth. It is what's called growth promotion. They have found that the antibiotic, it works from chickens to cows. It's a wide swath of vertebrate evolution. The, the scientists have found that virtually any antibacterial agent that is used works regardless of its chemical structure, its class, its target, or its spectrum. Antiviral drugs do not work. Antifungal drugs do not work. Importantly, the earlier in life the antibiotics are started, the bigger the effect on the growth rate of the farm animals the bigger the effect on feed efficiency, the conversion of calories and in food into body mass, which in fact is what farmers are trying to do. They're trying to raise their animals fa as fast as possible. 
So when we saw this, this really suggests that we're looking at a phenomena that's happening in early life development. So we began to do a series of studies in mice in which we gave mice antibiotics or not, we examined properties in the mice, we examined the microbiome, and we looked for relationships. And now I'm gonna show you the results of some of these mouse studies. Our first studies were done by Dr. Il-Sung Cho when he was a, a, a fellow in my lab, a gastroenterologist at NYU. Il-Sung gave mice four different antibiotic regimens at the midpoint of the level approved by the FDA for use on the farm or no antibiotics. And here we're looking at percent body fat in the mice. And so the mice that received antibiotics are putting on more fat than the mice that did not receive antibiotics. And here you can kind of see an illustration of this. This was our first indication that antibiotics were changing metabolism in the mice. Ilsung showed many other things. You can go to his paper to see it, but I will uh, move on to the next study. And this was a study that Laurie Cox did. She was a graduate student in my lab. Lori wanted to know what was the effect of combining a diet that was high in fat, high in calories with antibiotics? Would there be additive effects or not? So she gave mice low dose antibiotic exposure, just like used on the farm, in this case, penicillin, or not. She put, had all the mice on normal chow. And then when the mice were 17 weeks old, she put half of them on a high fat diet and half remained on the normal chow. Here's the main results of the study in terms of body mass. Lori looked at male mice and female mice. She looked at their total mass, their fat mass, and their lean or muscle mass. If we start with the male mice, this black line is the control male mice, normal chow, no antibiotics. Normal chow with antibiotics, they're bigger. Um, High fat diet, bigger still. High fat plus antibiotics, big est. Muscle mass increased on antibiotics, just like on the farm. Fat mass, the mice that put on the most fat were in the, or in the high fat group, but high fat plus antibiotics even more. Female mice, many of the same trends. If we look at fat mass in the female mice, the average female mouse on the high fat diet alone five grams of body fat, high fat diet plus antibiotics, 10 grams. They doubled the amount of body fat. The antibiotic potentiated the effect of the high fat, high calorie diet. Up to this point, the mice were getting antibiotics for their whole life. So Laurie did an experiment to ask if the antibiotic exposure is just limited, would this changes be durable? So in addition to mice on no antibiotics, and lifelong antibiotics, she had a group that had only eight weeks of antibiotics or only four weeks of antibiotics. Here's the effect on total mass, lean mass, and fat mass. The black line is the control group. What Lori found is that all three groups of mice receiving antibiotics had increases in total, lean, and fat mass. So four weeks of antibiotics beginning early in life was sufficient to confer the full effect. We were interested in what was going on in the intestine with the antibiotics. So here we're looking at the effect of these subtherapeutic antibiotics on a population of T cells in the intestine that are very important in how the intestine develops. These are called Th17 cells. This was work done by Jackie Leung in Pung Lok's lab. We looked in the small intestine and the large intestine. We measured it several different ways, but however we measured it, TH17 cells are down in the group with antibiotics. This was a very consistent finding. So the antibiotics were not only changing body mass, they were changing immune cell populations. So then we wanted to know what about the microbiome? What, was, what were the antibiotics doing to the microbiome? So this slide looks at the, the community structure of the microbiome in mice that are three weeks old. And at three weeks, mice, are either rece not receiving antibiotics, the control group, or all three groups that got eventually got antibiotics were all getting antibiotics at that point. 
So now we're, this is what's called a principal coordinates analysis. Each circle is the composite of the gut microbiome in one mouse. Black is control, uh, antibiotics is in orange. What we see is that there's a lot of variation in the populations of microbes in the control mice. And there's variation in the mice that receive antibiotics. They're largely overlapping, but not completely. And that's not surprising because one group is receiving antibiotics, the other is not. Now we're gonna look at community structure at eight weeks. And I'll tell you that in this talk, this is probably the single most important slide. So let me go through it. So in this, at eight weeks, we had three groups of mice, no antibiotics, continued antibiotics, or four weeks of antibiotics and then stopping. So now we look at their microbial populations. Here's the, the control group in black, the antibiotic group in orange, they're even more distant than they were before, which is not surprising. They're continuing to get antibiotics. But in the group that got antibiotics and then stopped for four weeks, their microbiomes had, had reverted to normal. So the effect of the antibiotic on the microbiome was only transient, but the effect on body mass and fat mass was permanent, it was lifelong. And this was our first evidence that if you alter the microbiome early in life, even if the effects are transient, there can be long-term consequences. So we wanted to know, is, is this, was this just a side effect of the antibiotic or is it really due to an altered microbiome? So we answered that with an experiment, a transfer experiment. What some of you have heard of is fecal transplants. We did something similar in mice. So there, there, we gave mice antibiotics or not. We sacrificed the mice and we took the contents of their intestine, their fecal contents from the antibiotic uh, exposed or, or not mice. And we gave them to germ-free mice. These are mice that had no bacteria. They were born in a bubble. And we now gave them their bacteria to live their life. We followed them for five weeks. None of these mice ever saw an antibiotic. So what was the effect? We're looking at total mass, lean mass, and fat mass. The black line are the mice that received the control microbiota. So the, the mice that received the antibiotic perturbed microbiota gained more weight. There was no change in their lean mass, but they had a significant increase in their fat mass as well. So this meant that the signal, the metabolic signal was in the microbiota. The microbiota was transforming, transferring these, these changes. Now, because we saw immune problems, we also wanted to know would the microbiota transfer the immune types. So here we're looking at expression of genes involved in intestinal defenses in the microbiota of donor and recipient mice. So here, here are the donor mice and we're looking at TH17, three genes related to TH17, two genes downstream of TH17. And here are the control mice, here are the mice that received antibiotics. We can see in all cases, uh, the levels are lower, just as we had come to expect. This, as I said, this is a very uh, reproducible finding. But now we wanna know what will happen in the recipient mice, the mice that got the control or the antibiotic perturbed microbiota. And the results are shown here. We see the same pattern as well. So the altered microbiota is transferring a different immunological state compared to the normal microbiota. So this indicated that, that that transient antibiotic exposure was altering both metabolism and immunity. So now I wanna talk a little more about immunity uh, in, in another sense. And I wanna tell you about a paper that was published four weeks ago in which I worked with a group of scientists from Denmark that were looking at at delivery mode, that is C-section versus normal vaginal birth, and whether there was any correlation with childhood asthma. Because it has been known for some time that kids born by C-section are more likely to develop asthma than kids not born by C-section. So we wanted to know, does this have anything to do with the altered microbiome from C-section? 
So here we're going to, and this is a complicated slide, but I'll walk you through it. Here we're going to look at the diversity of the microbiome in fecal samples in the first year of life by how the children were developed. In this, this is a study of, of about 700 children. Each dot is the microbiome in one child. And we're looking at samples at one week, one month, or one year of life. So the blue circle is the composite of kids born vaginally, and the red is kids born by C-section. You can see that they're quite significantly different at one week, at one month, and by one year, they have converged, not completely, but they have largely converged. So there, there's an early life difference in the microbiome, whether kids are born by C-section or vaginally. And then we divided the vaginal group, the kids born vaginally, into whether they had received antibiotics or not. And here we show the C-section again. So here are kids born vaginally, no antibiotics. Here's C-section and vaginal with antibiotics. You can see it's a kind of intermediate group. And you see that at one month. And again, by one year, everything conserved. So now we wanted to know, does it matter what the microbe microbes are in relation to C-section. So we developed a formula to look at a high-risk microbiome and a low-risk microbiome. And the results are shown here. This is, again, a Kaplan-Meier estimate of the cumulative risk of asthma in the first six years of life in here 544 children by how they were delivered and what was their microbial score when they were one year old. So Here's the risk of asthma here. Here's age up to six. Kids born vaginally, about 6% of them uh, developed asthma by the time they're six. And kids born by C-section with a low score, it's very similar to vaginal. But kids born by C-section with a high score, their risk of asthma was, was in, ex in excess of 20%. So, in general, C-section was associated with higher risk of asthma, but it mattered what was the state of their microbiome. So obstetricians and pediatricians never had microbiome on their, uh, on their uh, palate when they were thinking about what are the benefits and risks of C-section. But there is more and more data indicating that C-section is perturbing the microbiome, and this is associated with disease risk consequences. Now I wanna talk about another area that might be concerning to this group, which is cancer, neoplastic diseases. So first I'll just show you something of interest. I'm not gonna to go too much into this. Uh, this slide was prepared by uh, Dr. Mary Claire King. She uh, published in Science about 17 years ago. She was the person who, who discovered the BRCA1 gene. And, and this slide looks at the cumulative risk of breast cancer incidence in, in family members uh, uh, of women who, had, uh, who have these mutations. And as we now know, if they have these mutations, they have more and more risk of getting breast cancer as they get older. But then she made a second graph, which is she looked at those data based on when the women were born. And here she found in blue is the curve for women be born before 1940. And here in red is the curve from women born after 1940. So genetically, they're the same. But something happened after 1940 that increased the risk of developing breast cancer in these women. And there has been other work, which I'm not going to discuss today, about antibiotic exposure. Instead, I'm going to talk about a second cancer, which is colon cancer. And this uh, is based on an article published by scientists at the National Cancer Institute looking at colon cancer trends over about a 40 year period in the US. And each of these little graphs shows the rate of colon cancer uh, by, by age uh, um, according to year of the study. And so in people who are over 85, the data are quite good. The rate of colon cancer seems to be falling. This is very, very good news. And we, we can see this. But as we look at people who are younger and younger, we see that the curve flattens out. 
And in fact, the curve starts to go up in young people. So colon cancer is much more common in older people than young people. But in young people, the, in, instead of the cases going away, they are increasing. So the, the investigators looked at the data in several different ways. And I'll just show you this, this graph looking at year of birth again. And so what they found is that in, in people born early in the 19th century, in the 20th century, colon cancer rates have been going down. But in people born later in the 20th century, colon cancer rates are going up, either cancer of the rectum or cancer of the colon. And the inflection point here is around 1950. Interestingly, all the, also the inflection point for when antibiotics came into wide practice. Now that alone, we might say is interesting. But I'd like to show you the next study, which is a study from Harvard Medical School by Chow and colleagues looking at long-term use of antibiotics and risk of colorectal adenoma. This is a pre-malignant lesion. These are polyps. These are lesions that will eventually lead to colon cancer if they're not recognized and treated. So this study is based on the nurses study, a study of 128,000 nurses who've been studied over the last 50 years or so and who filled out periodic questionnaires. And in this study, they, they examined 16,000 nurses who had colonoscopy performed when they were over the age of 60. And of those 16,000 nurses, they found that about 1,200 of them had polyps or adenomas. And here they're asking, what's the rate of their having one of these adenomas according to whether they used antibiotics in the period between the age of 40 and 59, over this 20 year period. And what they found is that yes, antibiotic use was associated with the development of these cancers. And the more antibiotic use they had, the higher the risk. Again, a rate, rate ratio of one is neutral. So these women who used a lot of antibiotics in that 20 year period had about 70% greater risk compared to women who didn't. And then they looked at antibiotic use between the age of 20 and 39. And again, they're finding a very similar trend. It's, it's, it's weaker, it's not as strong, but it's in the same direction. Both of these studies are consistent with the idea that exposure to antibiotics in some way may be driving the risk for colon cancer. I wanna mention a couple of metabolic problems. One of them is diabetes. So investigators have asked, is there a relationship between antibiotics and diabetes? And so this study I'm showing you here is from, from Denmark, where the investigators looked at more than 1 million people in their study to ask, is there an association with prior exposure to antibiotics and having diabetes? And the main finding is shown here. People who had antibiotics before they developed diabetes were more likely to develop to have diabetes than those who didn't have antibiotics, 20% more likely or 50% more likely if they had multiple courses of antibiotics. And one could say, well, maybe they got antibiotics because they already had diabetes. But in fact, the investigators looked back 15 years prior to the diagnosis of diabetes and they found very consistent relationships. Here's one, here's the neutral point. Uh, Exposure to antibiotics was at any time in these last 15 years was associated with increased risk of having diabetes. Now, probably no doctor has ever told you this because this is really, this is developing information, but it, it is very worse. Not only that, there have now been studies looking at antibiotic exposure and kidney stones. These are people, this is a big study of, uh, of almost 300,000 people in the, in the United Kingdom uh, and showing again that antibiotic exposure was associated with risk of, of kidney stone development. These were not antibiotics that they got for their kidney stones. This is antibiotics that they got for their bronchitis and for their throat infections. So that's where, that's where most of the antibiotics are being used. Now I wanna to turn to one other problem, which is the generational problem of antibiotics. 
So as many of you may know, the incidence of inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease is increasing around the world. Here are data uh, for Mexico. You can see this trend over about a 15 year period and the, and the results in the United States have a lot of similarities as well. So why is IBD going up? Well, a group of scientists in Denmark studied all the children born in Denmark. They have very good records about antibiotic use. And they showed that the more courses of antibiotics that kids got in the first two years of life were associated with an increased risk of getting inflammatory bowel disease, especially Crohn's disease. So again, this is correlation. And we wanted to study this in an animal model so that we could actually look at causal roles. And we decided that we would add, that we would look into the next generation. So we asked the question, can an antibiotic altered microbiota affect IBD outcome in the next generation? So to do this, we studied regular wild type mice and a group of, of mutant mice, IL-10 deficient mice. These are mice that spontaneously develop colitis. And we wanted to know would antibiotic exposure drive their colitis? So this study was done by Angel Schulfer when she was a graduate student in my lab. Angel prepared some antibiotic perturbed microbiota from mice or normal microbiota. And she gave them again to germ-free mice, but in this case, the germ-free mice were pregnant. So she conventionalized these pregnant mice, either wild type or IL-10 deficient. Uh, all the mice now had one or the other microbiota. And then in due course, the mice gave birth to their pups. And then we followed the pups until they were middle-aged. We wanted to know, would exposure to that antibiotic perturbed microbiota affect the ecology in their gut? Would it affect disease? And we had saw many effects on ecology and you'll just have to take my word for it or you can see it in the paper, but I wanna focus on disease. So this slide shows the colonic pathology in these IL-10 deficient pups when they were 21 weeks old, middle-aged for a mouse, according to the microbiota to which their mothers were exposed. So here's a pup whose mom was exposed to control microbiome. This colon is abnormal. There is colitis here, uh, but that, that's what we expected. But if the pup's mom was exposed to antibiotic perturbed microbiota, the colitis is much worse. You can see how much thicker it is. It's much more cellular. And in fact, when we look at, at the, uh, across the group, the difference in the, uh, the scores are, are about 30 fold. This is not a small effect, it's a very dramatic effect. So let me summarize this, in, uh, this experiment to remind you that these pups never saw an antibiotic. In fact, their mother never saw an antibiotic. All they saw was an antibiotic perturbed microbiota. And that means that the enhanced disease signal that we are seeing is entirely microbial. That means that antibiotic effects can cross generations. And it also means that inheritance is not just based on human genes, but based on microbes and their genes as well. So let me summarize up to this point. And that is that I've shown that antibiotics can have long-term effects on metabolism and immunity that the effects are due to perturbing the microbiome. I've indicated that other factors of modern life can also contribute like C-section, but that hasn't been a focus of this talk, that the effects may be transmitted to the next generation and that we need to find and implement solutions. And uh, for you, the, uh, these, these, the points that I'm talking about are important for your children and for your grandchildren and for the future generations. So act four, final act, hope. So I mentioned that we've been having diversity loss in our microbiome. And this was a paper we published in Science a few years ago. Here's microbiome diversity scale over 200 years. Here's this blue line would be the United States where our microbiome has been stepping down in diversity. The red line might be a country that modernized later like India or China. And so they started later, but they are catching up in a hurry. And yellow might be peoples in Africa and 
Africa and Latin America who are just starting on the developmental path. This is our schema in 2016. And really the question is, what's the future gonna bring? What are the next steps for the microbiome? Is it gonna decline further? Are we gonna be able to arrest the decline? Or are we gonna be able to reverse this through restorative steps? That's really the question before us. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to do more research about the consequences of perturbing the microbiota in humans, especially with antibiotics, C-sections, formula feeding. We need to educate the public and profession about the risks of, of these medical procedures. We need to develop new kinds of antibiotics that are narrow in spectrum that don't have a lot of collateral damage. That will mean better diagnostics and specific agents. And we're gonna need to remediate. We're gonna have to replace acutely lost microbes, maybe using some probiotics of the future. And we have to enhance the depleted ones maybe with prebiotics. We have to reverse what's going on. We have to archive some of these vanished organisms and replace them. And we have to monitor, is it working at, at all? So. I think as a medical doctor, I can tell you that we have to change, the, we have to shift the paradigm to reduce the damage. Right now, the paradigm may be, this may not help, but it won't hurt. And we have to move to the paradigm that we have to use antibiotics only when necessary. So in practice, that means avoiding use in which reported benefits are only marginal because the costs may exceed the benefits, do not harm. And we can you apply the same thinking to C-sections, formula feeding, and other antibacterial practices. So after the CDC published their data in 2010 of cumulative antibiotic use, and shown here, cumulative courses of antibiotics over age, a group in Sweden published their results on antibiotic use in Sweden. And so at the age of three, the average child in Sweden had about 1.4 courses of antibiotics. The average child in the US had about four courses. And by the age of 10, the average child of Sweden had four courses, but we have 10 courses. So it's clear that it is possible to reduce antibiotic exposure. The children in Sweden are no less healthy than, than they are here. Uh, and so it suggests that a lot of the antibiotics we're using are unnecessary, really at all ages, but it is especially important in childhood. So another possibility is that in the medicine of the future, the pediatrician of the future in analyzing the health of a newborn, of a, of a baby, will examine the baby and they will examine the baby's diaper. And they will ask, does this baby have the global microbes that every baby should have? Do they have the personal microbes that a baby of this particular genotype and biomarkers should have? And if they don't, the doctor of the future is gonna reach into their armamentarium and replace those missing microbes to optimize child health. And they will have to keep monitoring and perhaps keep reshaping the microbiome to, to optimize health. This, this is my prediction for the medicine of the future. Where will they get these microbes? Well, a few years ago, a, a group of scientists led by Maria Gloria Dominguez, who in full disclosure is my wife, developed a concept called the microbiota vault. This is uh, similar to the seed vault in Norway, which is a global nonprofit effort to conserve long-term health for humanity. We wanna store the vanishing microbiota so that we will be able to replace it when the doctors of the future will need it. You can read more about this in our paper in science or go to the web microbiotavault.org. Before finishing, I wanna recognize many of the people who did some of the experiments that I've shown. I've mentioned Il Sung Cho, Nick Bakulich, Laurie uh, Cox, uh, Angel Schulfer, among others. Many other colleagues helped us. We had support from the US government and a number of different foundations. And in closing, uh, I wanna plug my book again, Missing Microbes. Uh, you can see that everybody is reading it. And with that, I will stop and thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Blazer. And um, your, your last slides 
um, are, are sort of prompting some questions here about your personal decisions and how you apply your science into your own life. So um, from Miriam, do you go out of your way to eat f food raised without antibiotics? And what about your children or grandchildren? Well, um, thank you for that question. Unfortunately, I have no grandchildren, so I'm I'm, I'm trying to prod my children uh, into more better activity. Uh, and uh, it, it happens that I, I have uh, not eaten meat uh, since 1976. And that, that was even before I knew anything about the microbiome. But um, my... Um, my practices, uh, uh, my my dietary practices are consistent with having a healthy microbiome. And th there's a lot we still don't know about diet in the microbiome. But the one thing we do know is that fiber is good. Fiber feeds the microbiome. Fiber feeds the beneficial microbes of the microbiome. So at, at just about every age, except for kids who are nursing, we, we I recommend uh, increasing your fiber. And Barbara asked, given the clear association of use of antibiotics and health risks, what are the cost benefit analysis or what are the cost benefits of the use of antibiotics? Um, that is, when should antibiotics be used? Yeah, so that's, that's a great and important question. And that's why I showed the difference between the US and Sweden, because Sweden, their, own, their, their, their practice of medicine they're getting away with using 40% of the antibiotics that we're using at every age. And that a priori suggests that 60% of the antibiotics that we're using are unnecessary. And I think across the board, Swedish doctors are examining patients better. And, and Swedish public is less sold on the value of the pill to cure all problems. There, there are children who have ear infections who are terribly ill they must get an antibiotic. There are children who have ear infections who are barely ill. They should never get antibiotics. And between that kind of black and white, there's a big gray area. And different doctors are cutting that gray in different places. We have to kind of shift over uh, the, the medical profession and, 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 and parents and, and, and grandparents, maybe in this audience, uh, need to re remind the parents that when the child is sick and you go to the doctor, the question should not be, can my doctor, can my child get an antibiotic? The question should be, please examine my child carefully and tell us whether an antibiotic is necessary or not. And I think if we change our practices, doctors are feeling a lot of pressure from many patients to, to give them an antibiotic as the quick fix. The parents feel that the child is deprived if they don't get an antibiotic. But there's more and more evidence of the kind that I am showing you. And there, there's much more out there. I'm just giving you the, high, the highlights and some recent stuff that antibiotics have cost. And as a profession, medicine has overvalued the use of antibiotics, which are fantastic drugs, but we have overvalued them. And we have under accounted for the costs of antibiotic use. And maybe you could um, expand on, on that note in the context of developing countries like Africa. Anjana asks, um, in countries like Africa where, where the low rate of catching, where we're seeing a, a low rate or catching up with the US and other Western nations with antibiotic use, children are dying of simple bacterial infections. How can one provide balance of the microbial world now and not 30 years later? Yeah, so that's a really important question because uh, because in developing countries, in, in Africa, the situation is more complex. Children are dying of acute bacterial infections. Children are dying of malnutrition. But in, in most developing countries of the world, the epidemic of obesity is bigger than the epidemic of malnutrition. So we, we kind of see in one country, we see malnourished kids, and then the kids uh, in the cities are are obese. And it, it's not just because they're eating Big Macs and, and French fries. That, that's why we did that experiment uh, called FATSTAT, where we showed that high fat diet makes the mice fat, antibiotics make the mice fat, but when you put them together, they get very fat. And as I showed you, which is something that most people wouldn't think a priori, 
in many developing countries, antibiotic use is higher than it is in the United States. It's been estimated that antibiotic use per capita in China is about five times higher than it is in the United States. In, I have colleagues who grew up in China who said that when when they got a, when they had a headache, their uh, their mother took them to the to the pharmacist and asked for an antibiotic. And the the great invention in China for many years ago of the barefoot doctors, which was a great innovation to bring uh, medical practitioners out to the countryside, it turns out that the barefoot doctors are paid according to the number of antibiotic regimens that they prescribe. So they have a very strong incentive to give antibiotics. And you shared that really um, illustrative map of the use of antibiotics across the United States and the differences uh, in, in the geographies. Barbara asked if you have any other data around um, the demographics of folks and, and the differences between those who are prescribed antibiotics or not. Um, so for example, by class or race, uh, presumably in the US. Yeah, so th that's a really good question. Uh, and I'm very interested in that topic. And in fact, we have a paper that's gonna come out in February about some of the reasons for overuse of antibiotics and reasons for the variation in antibiotic use, because there's tremendous variation. I'll just, before answering the question, I'll tell you about a study that was done in Philadelphia a few years ago uh, of, of 29 pediatric practices associated with the Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania, CHOP, one of the best children's hospitals in the world. And they looked at per capita antibiotic prescribing by the doctors. And between the group that prescribed the least and the group that prescribed the most antibiotics per capita, the variation was 100%. And so these are among outstanding doctors. You see that there's tremendous variation. So the CDC data shows that the counties where you have the most educated people on average have the lowest antibiotic group. And conversely, high antibiotic use is associated with low education, low socioeconomic status. In our paper that comes out, we're gonna show that antibiotic use map again, and we're gonna show it next to another map, which is the map of opioid use in the United States. And it's the same map. And we're gonna show it against the map on church attendance in the United States, and it's the same map as well. And I, I don't think that going to church makes people take antibiotics, but there seem to be some parallels. And we think it has to do with the power relationships and reliance on authority. Right, and you, were t you discussed the, the difference in culture and practice of medicine across populations, so. Um, Bernie asked uh, a question that has a couple of parts, so I'll just read it verbatim. Have the important changes in the first three years of life been disaggregated when comparing those changes to changes in the microbiome? For example, you mentioned cognition. Have there been any studies of specific changes in the microbiome that are correlated with cognitive development? Yeah, so that's a, that's a very important topic. And um, I, for, I've been interested uh, for a very long time in autism, which is a disease that has risen dramatically in, in the last six decades. And some of that is due to doctors recognizing it better, but a lot of it is not due to that. As far as we can tell, autism is really rising all over the developed world and, and even in China. And autism, uh, uh, develops in the first two or three years of life. There are children diagnosed even at the age of one who are autistic. And so the, the timing of autism uh, in life and the timing of it across the population really suggests to me that the microbiome may have something to do with it. But it's a very difficult problem to study because you really have to study kids before they become autistic, not after, because a disease changes the microbiome. And so that's, that's where we, we and others can study it in animal models, in mice, where we can study ways of affecting the microbiome and um, whether there would be a relationship with autism. And there, there are 
there are indications that this is true. Now, in our study that we did with the Mayo Clinic, all in all, uh, autism was not associated with antibiotic use in the first two years of life. I thought it would be, but it was not. But if you look at our paper, you will see that autism was associated with specific antibiotic use and not with others. There, there was one antibiotic, the most widely used antibiotic were the penicillins, that seemed to be protective, inversely associated with autism. But the use of a group of antibiotics called cephalosporins was strongly associated. So we're trying to follow up on this. And we could, we could say, well, maybe the reason is that certain antibiotics affect certain microbes and other antibiotics affect other microbes. So this is, this is all work in development, but this early, this early years, and I can just tell you that our, our study with the Mayo Clinic uh, showed an association of antibiotic use with learning disability. And now I'm part of a second study in the UK and it's showing that again. There are a few questions about how this research um, is and that the publications are being disseminated. So to what extent have pediatricians in America and in other parts of the world been informed of this research? Has HHS or the CDC done education for doctors or the public around this issue? Um, another audience member asked if it's been shared with the Gates Foundation, um, which does so much to help nutrition needs in less developed um, countries, I believe. Is what they meant. I'm just going to turn on the light in my room. Yeah, so of uh, course, as daylight changes. Okay, so there, I think that'll be a little better. So yes, um, great. Uh, yeah, I mean, th this is this is why I'm speaking you, to you today. I mean, I and others are very interested in getting this message out, not just to scientists and doctors, which are very important. Uh, uh, but also to the general public so that people, under, and that's why I wrote Missing Microbes. Uh, uh, I, I wrote it eight years ago, it was published six years ago, uh, but I've been actually thinking about this for 20 years and I realized I had to write a book for the public because uh, the doctors can't resist parents who say, give my child an antibiotic. The public, the public has to know about this. So yes, uh, our, our work has been funded by, by the NIH and by uh, different foundations. I would love to get support from the Gates Foundation so far. We, we've had a little support, but I'd say not enough. Uh, and um, uh, myself and others who understand this uh, speak at scientific and medical meetings uh, all over the world uh, ab about this because this is a big issue. You know, you know there, there are kids who have asthma and there are kids who have obesity and there are people who have IBD, but antibiotic use is across the world. Everyone in the world is using antibiotics at a tremendous scale. And that's why I made the analogy to global warming because it's, it's, it's a global change in our microecology and it's, seen, it's happening fast. It's probably happening on a faster scale than global warming. That's why, that's why we have to fix it. Absolutely. Um, I think the age of extinction is a really helpful framework for, to express the, the urgency. Um, there are a few, few questions about the, the bigger systems at play. So how much does insurance have to do with the overuse of antibiotics or the pharmaceutical industry? Yeah, so... Yes, they both have to do with the antibiotics and the whole financing of medical care in the world has to do with it. And in part, it's because of this lack of transparency that doctors and patients are overvaluing antibiotics. They see antibiotics as drugs that only have benefit and they're undercounting the costs or the risks. So the doctor uh, who has a sick child is afraid not to give them an antibiotic because they may miss something important. They're, they're worried about missing something important as opposed to the cumulative damage that's being done. And again, in our studies and other studies, the more courses a kid gets of antibiotics, the greater their risk of various diseases. It's cumulative. So people are worried about the catastrophic rare event and they're not taking into account the mundane everyday event of, of 
of the problem piling up. And I think actuarially, um, uh, we, we need to recalculate the benefit risk ratios of antibiotics. Right now, insurance companies, they're, they're thinking about the old data. And pharmaceutical companies, in general, they're not that interested in antibiotics in general, most of the antibiotics are, are not big money makers for them, but the practitioners, the, the, the doctors, the nurse practitioners, the urgent care centers all over the, all over the world, it, it's clear that antibiotic use is much greater when people go to urgent care centers than if they go to their regular doctor because they're afraid of that catastrophic rare event. And they, they don't, they don't, they're not gonna see the patient again. They don't, really, they don't really care what's gonna happen five years from now. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Rita asks, are there any programs, classes, activities, or advice you would have for undergraduate students hoping to further study their burgeoning field? Uh, I imagine related to, related to this talk. Would you have told you, what would you have told yourself back when you were in school? Yeah, well, that's a very good. Um, in, in missing microbes, I, I talk about uh, the treatment of my daughter uh, when I was a young doctor, and she had a lot of ear infections. She had a lot of courses of antibiotics. We we thought we were helping her, uh, and actually, it was prescribed by her doctor. But I I wasn't against it. I, I thought he was right. But in retrospect, I see that uh, we made her, uh, we exposed her unnecessarily. And unfortunately, I can tell you that today she has celiac disease, which I think uh, there's, there's increasing evidence that celiac disease is related to antibiotic use as well. Celiac disease is another one of those diseases that has increased dramatically in the last 50 years. So yes, so in my list of things to do, education is part of it, uh, ed education of, of students. To, people need to understand that antibiotics are very powerful drugs. They seem miraculous because uh, even though they're so powerful, they don't have very many immediate side effects. But you, you can't use something so powerful uh, and, and, uh, and, and not have any effects. And we have time for just a couple of, uh, a couple of more questions. There are a, f a lot of questions about um, the effectiveness of supplements. So taking probiotics, for example, to counteract um, this decreased um, diversity in the microbiome or increasing one's fiber using fiber pills. So if you could speak to that. Well, first, uh, I'll do the easy one. Fi fiber, is, as far as we can tell, fiber is generally good. And if you look at the diet of, of our human ancestors, you know, back 100,000 years ago or more, based on archaeologic and anthropologic data, um, uh, they were eating a lot more fiber than we do. So you, you could just say that we evolved in, in, a, in a world with much more fiber in the diet and we're in a low fiber state now. Now the issue of probiotics and supplements is more complicated and many doctors prescribe probiotics after someone is, takes antibiotics. But in fact, the evidence base for that is very slim, number one. Number two is that there are many different probiotics out there. There are hundreds of different compounds. No one knows if they're equivalent or not. And some of them, they're the organisms alive, some of them, they're dead. They have single organisms, they have mixtures. It's a little hard to generalize about it. But there was a very good study that was published in Cell about two years ago from Israel, where scientists gave mice uh, and humans antibiotics, and then they followed up with a probiotic. And they asked, how fast would their microbiome be restored? compared to if they didn't take a probiotic. And the answer is that it was restored more slowly with the probiotic. And this, the, the data are actually quite convincing. And in retrospect, we can see that the antibiotic are perturbation one, but in fact, the probiotic is perturbation two. So the effect is compounded. Now that was a, a study with only one probiotic, but it establishes the principle. And again, the, the, the widespread use of probiotics after antibiotics, uh, I call uh, the, the triumph of wishful thinking over evidence. Um, 
So maybe to have a more future looking question to, to wrap up today, um, Bernie asks, um, have you used artificial intelligence in these studies? Because the types of studies you are involved in are particularly amenable to those kinds of tools. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's there's a lot of work uh, with AI and because there's a lot of big data. The, the microbiome is quite complex and people are doing very multi-dimensional analyses. And some of these tools are really positive. Just let me just say to end on a on a more positive note and a, is you know, we, we really think that the future is gonna be with, restore, with restoration. If we de decrease antibiotic use, maybe we can get things to level off that they won't keep declining, but we actually have to restore the depleted microbiota. And that's why I think the doctors of the future are gonna be giving microbes back to babies, just like today we give vaccines to babies to uh, routinely. Uh, we, we will try to understand what are the organisms they're missing and try to give them back so they can have healthier lives. I think that's, that's the main future. And I think doing that will help us prevent some of these diseases that are, that are growing quite a bit. Thank you so much, Dr. Blazer. And um, we have many more questions in the Q&A, but unfortunately we've run out of time. So I've, I've tried my best to summarize. Um, Send that like to bring... me by email and I'll, I'll try okay. to I, I will. Um, and I'd like to bring Leslie Herman back up on stage, the virtual stage, to give concluding remarks and let us know what to expect in the spring. Thank you again. Good. Thank you so much. That was just a wonderful talk and uh, a lot for us to think about. And we're going to think twice the next time we get an ear infection. So um, thank you so much for coming and speaking to us. And um, uh, thank all of you for coming, and uh, we will be in touch with you about future Fridays at three talks for the spring semester. Thanks to all of you, and stay well. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.